Um, so I, I just up, have up here uh, the, the folks who are named authors. We also, one of the authors you'll notice is the Rapid Test Working Group, which represents an international collaboration of, of, of numerous highly, highly intelligent, highly skilled, um, highly interesting and wonderful people that we all work with on these efforts. So I just wanted to bring attention to the fact that this work would not have been possible without this uh, incredible team run at Rapid Test that was started by Chris Sade. Um, and uh, Dr. Michael Minna and, and other folks who were involved with that. So thank you, our deepest thanks for all of your support in making um, you know, our efforts to make progress possible together. So with that, um, we have uh, you know, uh, just the, some of the, the authors are represented with the little pins on the map, um, just to give you an idea that this collaboration that we're about to tell you about spans um, continents. <laughs> So joining us here from across the world are two of our collaborators on this paper. We have Dr. Louise Kenny from the University of Liverpool and Mr. Desmond Alumnoa from the Green Africa Youth Organization. Hi, Sherry and hi all, and thank you so much for the very kind invitation to join today. Um, so hello from England um, and from Liverpool where we have been conducting, I think what is now uh, one of the largest uh, cohort studies of rapid antigen testing um, that we've seen during this pandemic. We've now tested over 600,000 residents uh, in our city with rapid antigen tests, um, and it's been an incredibly useful public health intervention uh, in the fight against COVID-19. And I'd just like to share three very quick thoughts um, about what we've learned through this exercise. Firstly, um, COVID is not a disease of equals, certainly in our city, in Liverpool. Um, it has exaggerated ingrained health inequalities, which is why I'm so passionate about the topic of this paper. Um, secondly, I think the phrase global village has never been uh, more true. Um, we are absolutely all, this, all in this together. And thirdly, uh, no one will be safe until we're all safe. So it's an absolute pleasure to be part of this global effort um, to make antigen, rapid antigen testing free and available to all. Thanks, Sherry. Thank you, Dr. Kenny. And hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for being with us. Um, we at Green Africa Youth Organization um, are glad to participate in this writing uh, since the outbreak of COVID-19 in Ghana and other parts of Africa where we've been working. We've been supporting communities and helping to overcome the idea of stigmatization and to improve, the, to encourage testing at the, the community level and also at the national level. We've been leveraging on the power of young academicians to broker knowledge at the community levels to, to support in eliminating COVID-19. And we stand uh, with all the points that have been raised in this paper. And uh, we hope that together we will be able to, to clamp down the pandemic in, uh, in no time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Alugnoa. So with that, um, we wanted to present uh, our paper. And so the four of us who are going to be presenting uh, are uh, Mo Johnson, Leon, uh, Maureen, uh, who goes by Mo uh, from Texas. Uh, I am uh, based in Boston right now and originally I'm from Florida. Um, and we also have our, our two outstanding research assistants uh, from Simmons University, Brianna DeHarnas and Emily Costanza. So we will be uh, sharing some highlights from our commentary with you. So with that, Mo, would you like to give us our overview? Awesome, thank you. Um, thank you. Hi everyone, I'm, I go by Mo. Um, and uh, as Sherry mentioned, I'm a researcher right now at the University of Texas, Austin, focusing on uh, data equity work. Um, I just wanna reemphasize that something that has been brought up throughout the presentation is that this was a highly uh, collaborative work. Um, we've heard from many of the people that participated. So when we talk about kind of the four main points in uh, this paper, which I think will appear on the screen shortly, um, that's really four main points that came from an executive summary that we, pub we that will be published next week that came from uh, a multi-page supplementary documents with a lot of uh, resources and um, case studies. And really, I want to also highlight all the collaborators came from a breadth of having field experience and research experience, being um, nurses at schools or researchers at universities, um, people with a variety of backgrounds. And I think this is just really important because the other thing is that we're all living through this pandemic as well. So 
what we're talking about are also kind of strategies that we wish to deploy within our own communities and families. So the main four points uh, with hopefully they give a little bit of hope, a little bit of imagination of what could be possible once we might have more access to rapid antigen testing is that this frequent rapid testing uniquely complements all the other infection prevention, mitigation strategies that we've been doing the entire pandemic. It's an additional tool. Also through modeling work and then other analysis, comparing these widespread rapid antigen testing to targeted and frequent molecular testing is a false equivalency that leads to harm. Um, you really um, want to have as much frequent testing as possible and just comparing them one for one um, really doesn't make sense as a testing strategy in pandemic response work. Also universal access to these uh, low cost, free, fast, rapid test is critical to have follow up and support in order to promote equity and reduce harm. At the end, we'll talk a lot from other uh, throughout the entire kind of uh, public health field. Self-testing has been shown to be effective for other diseases. And so we're also advocating for that here. And each of us will we'll talk a little bit more about each point. Thank you, Mo. Great, so um, this should look familiar for this first point, which is basically the Swiss cheese model. And um, the idea is that any individual intervention on its own is not perfect. And uh, we need all of the interventions together to be able to protect people, especially on a population level. And um, if you note here at the bottom, we have um, a little mouse <laughs> that just happened to be in the original illustration that illustrates how important, and the mouse agrees, uh, testing is and, uh, and tracing. And so that's, that's basically what we're trying to say here, that when we have rapid tests, it really helps us uh, build up that capacity that's really important in this model to protect people. So uh, for our second point here, uh, Dr. Minna, I'm not sure if you wanted to, to say something as well. Sure, I'll, I'll just uh, describe briefly. So um, there's been a lot of confusion about the different types of tests. For example, PCR tests, which are very, very high analytical sensitivity, but uh, anyone who's gotten a PCR test uh, out in the sort of regular world, outside of the, the wealthy academic institutions, uh, has potentially seen that these tests sometimes take multiple days to return and, and simply aren't used, uh, they can't be used daily for the most part, uh, nor even multi, you know, two or three times a week would be a very huge burden to place on PCR testing. So, um, but when we look at the infection dynamics or the kinetics of the virus within a person, it turns out uh, that uh, the analytical sensitivity of the test, as I mentioned earlier, is not nearly as important as the frequency with which you can test people. And so this is just a, a diagram. This comes from a, a paper we published recently in the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, which discusses uh, the frequency issue and, and frequency versus sensitivity. And so what this is showing is the viral kinetics within an individual uh, and uh, essentially it shows that if you're testing frequently with a lower analytical sensitivity test, but the, the very, by, by the nature of testing frequently, you're more likely, not less, to catch people when they are infectious. And that's because it's all about the frequency. Now, what, what I'm showing on the y-axis here is the viral load inside of a person after they get infected. Uh, once people become infected, no test will detect them for the first few days during this incubation period when the virus is at very, very low levels. But then PCR will start, if you, had, if you were able to be testing somebody you know, every moment of the day, you'd find that um, PCR will, will turn positive in a person. And then within about 15 hours, a rapid antigen test, a lower sensitivity test will also turn positive. And in fact, we just finished a, a large clinical study that, that is showing us, and we'll be trying to get that published soon. Uh, but essentially the window between which the high sensitivity and the low sensitivity test is very, very narrow. And so what this is really showing is it's almost never worth uh, reducing frequency in order to gain that improvement in terms of high analytical sensitivity. That's never the appropriate trade-off when you're trying to have a public health test, it's frequency above all else will allow you to find somebody when they're infectious. And then the infectious window is only about five days. So if you're not giving somebody a, re a result very quickly, uh, then it's not a, an effective test. If, it, if you have to wait three days to get your result, then even if you found somebody on day one of their infect infection, 
um, you would be missing almost their whole transmissible window. And so while we continue to make assessments of these different tests based on their analytical sensitivity, what we really should be focusing on is the effectiveness of the test to help abrogate transmission. And when we uh, focus on the effectiveness of the test, then it turns out that low frequency PCR testing or low frequency testing using even a very high sensitivity test is not going to be effective. Because as, as you see in these two bottom dots here on the high analytical sensitivity um, metric, if you were just kind of doing this routinely, uh, you would be more likely to totally miss somebody's entire infectious period and then just catch them on their post-infectious period after they've actually been transmitting. So as a public health tool, these very high analytical sensitivity tests, unless they can be done very frequently and with very rapid results, are not going to be as effective as a lower analytical sensitivity, but much more higher sensitivity to catch infectious people when they're infecting type of test, and that's all based on the frequency. Uh, and, and tests like these that I'm holding in my hand here, these are the, the really inexpensive rapid antigen paper strip tests. They work just like a pregnancy test. You see two lines if you're positive and one line if you're negative. If these turn positive, it generally means you are infectious. And these tests have also been very, very high specificity, which has been another concern uh, out of thousands that we have now used, we still have yet to find one false positive. It's been 100% specificity over 5,000. And this actually fits with multiple uh, studies that have happened across the world. So, so while we continue to evaluate tests based, uh, these antigen tests based uh, against the PCR, uh, based on their analytical sensitivity alone, we really need to take the test program into account in order to best evaluate how appropriate one test is versus another for public health use. Now, this is an example that I like to show. Uh, if you have a school-based entrance screening program, for example, and you're trying to keep a school safe, uh, if you open up school and on the first day of school, as an example, you have uh, five students who walk into school who are infected or who show up at school on day one who are infectious. A PCR test, you could have a 100% sensitive PCR test, but it takes two days to return results. If you use that PCR test on day one, those five students will walk around for the next two days infectious until they get their PCR results back and then they'll be pulled out of, out of circulation. So it's 100% sensitive but you have 10 person days walking around infecting others. So that might lead, for example, to eight, you know, eight or so additional people infected and upwards of 20 or 25 people who have to go into two week quarantine. On the other hand, if you look on the bottom uh, of this figure, you have a rapid antigen testing program. You have the same five kids walk into school, but the test is only say 80% sensitive. Now we know that these tests actually achieve much greater than that when people are infectious, but we'll be conservative. If those five students are uh, tested with the antigen test along with everyone else going into school the first day, the lower sensitivity antigen test will catch four of those five. One of them will slip by because it's 20% of the individuals. So one person will slip by. They will walk around school. Ideally, they are low transmission that first day, which is why they were negative on the rapid test, they weren't quite at the, at the level needed to detect yet. But then maybe the second day, they'll infect one or two people. But overall, this means that with the 80% rapid antigen test, because you were able to pull those first four out on day one, uh, you had only two person days of somebody walking around infectious versus 10. What does this mean? At the end of the, the end result of this means that despite using a less sensitive test, uh, the, because it gave fast results and immediately actionable results, you might end up with one or two individuals infected versus an additional eight. And you might end up with around five individuals having to get quarantined versus 20 or 25. So overall, what we see here is that the lower sensitivity test, because it's two person days versus 10 person days infectious walking around school, is the better public health test, even if it might not be the better medical diagnostic test for somebody. 
And so this is just a, a, a toy example to demonstrate. And actually, we now have real world examples of where this exact scenario has played out. Fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Minna. So for our third point, um, we're going to turn it over to Mo and Brianna to talk about universal access to free, frequent rapid testing and why this is crucial for promoting equity and why it's so important to have follow up and support as part of it. So it's not enough to just keep, give people these tests or use these tests. You really need to have the other piece where you're supporting people after they receive the results. So um, Mo, please go ahead. Yeah, so this third point is really focused on this kind of idea of accessibility, free, low cost, um, with ability to be able to follow up. Um, I'm speaking on this point a little bit, both as a researcher who focuses on uh, both rural populations and populations that have been made vulnerable through a variety of factors. Um, it's really been, you know, very well documented that the ability to protect yourself in this pandemic has really functioned on a gradient of economic elitism. Um, and that there have been incredible racial and ethnic disparities um, in the US and then also um, many disparities abroad too. Um, so the test to be accessible um, universally, there have to be kind of support and follow up that has to be a, a low enough price for different communities to buy it. It has to be geographically available, whether you live in an urban or rural area, location matters. Can you go to a community center? Can you go to a, a hospital? Can you do it at home? Um, the ability to have agency is really important here, particularly with re having to reach and support some of the communities that have been hardest hit. Um, on a personal level, I know people that are essential workers, uh, non-medical essential workers, that this entire pandemic haven't even had access to one type of test. And so they're going into work often blind, despite doing their best to, to mask and social distance. Um, the other reason, though, that testing can sometimes be a difficult decision for a worker to make, um, if that a positive might indicate that they have to go home without support, without pay, that can be economically devastating for a whole host of people. Um, so when we talk about access to uh, frequent uh, and low cost rapid test, that piece, uh, that equity piece of providing support, of understanding the different needs of different populations, of really reaching out is a, a key part of this. Hi everyone, my name is Brianna. I'm a research assistant here at Simmons University in Boston. Just gonna touch on that last point just a little bit. Um, so even those who are able to get a COVID test, um, either it's a positive COVID test or you know you've had a positive COVID exposure, uh, many of these people are not able to isolate. Um, so I have seen this firsthand working at the Dimmick Center in Boston. And this is a community health organization that works primarily with low and middle income families in the Boston area. Um, and I help connect them with the various resources. And um, when I'm speaking with these families over the phone, uh, when it's regarding COVID, they have to make the decision between paying utility bills, feeding their families, paying rent, and also balancing that with keeping their coworkers safe. So it's really um, not just a simple yes or no answer for them. And so what we need to do is uh, support them in their self-isolation, providing resources for those in low and middle income communities to do what is best for the health of them, their families, and their coworkers. Thank you, Brianna and Mo. So we, we wanted to just also say briefly here a few words on why we chose our title of it's wrong not to test. Because at first glance, this might seem like a very negative statement to make, and maybe there's a positive way to frame it. And I promise we did think about this, but we were very deliberate with our choice. And so uh, the, our motivation for, uh, for using this title, and this is the premise of our work, this is a quote from our commentary, is that in the midst of a raging plague, it is inequitable and unethical not to deploy high quality rapid tests alongside existing public health interventions. And this is really our guiding uh, thought that, that, uh, that led us to uh, all the arguments and evidence that we pulled together for this commentary. So um, you might think that a statement like it's right always to test uh, might be equivalent to saying something like it's right to test. And actually these two statements are, are not actually the same thing. So the one on the right, it's right to test, 
it's basically what the World Health Organization has been telling us since last year, test, test, test. And I think, you know, leading experts, a lot of people are on board with the idea that we need to test and there have been calls for this and there have been a lot of efforts to improve our testing infrastructure to meet demand. Um, it's a slightly different statement from it's always right to test, which actually um, is, is a little bit problematic in the sense that when we're talking about tests, we're really talking about people. And we really need to remember that at the end of the day, people have autonomy. They should be able to make choices about what's done with and about their bodies and their health. And so that is why we came to the conclusion that what we're really trying to say is that it's wrong not to test because the big problem right now is there are a lot of people in the world who don't have access to testing either because they're sort of um, cut out of, of existing testing infrastructure. They can't afford it, they can't access it. There are also very sad situations right now in the US and other places where people have free tests from the federal government, but they're sitting in a closet or something because people are afraid to use them because they don't know how to use them or they're misinformed about what their utility might be. And so that is why we felt compelled to make the statements that we wanna make or that we've made in this commentary because we felt like it was something that wasn't being said as loudly as it should be right now. And so um, that actually is a great segue into our last point that's gonna be presented by uh, Emily Costanza, who's uh, one of our research assistants at Simmons along with Brianna. Thank you, Emily. Um, our fourth point is self-testing is effective. And I just wanna highlight a couple points of that. Uh, self-testing is already used very successfully in many areas of our lives already from at-home pregnancy tests to HIV self-tests. And these tests empower us to take action sooner rather than later. HIV self-testing in particular has shown to be one of the best ways to reach high-risk groups, obtain comparable results to that of healthcare workers, and has been projected to increase testing overall while increasing health gains. In addition, there is evidence from usability studies that show that self-testing at home would provide similar advantages. Self-testing would be an enormously valuable tool in the fight to prevent the spread of COVID-19, give us a chance for more immediate care um, and protect others from getting COVID-19. Thank you, Emily. And this, this video is a screenshot from the National Health Service in the UK where they have um, a, a, a little video to help people with self-administered testing. So thank you very much, Emily. Thank you, everyone.